Hey everyone, good morning. It's Michelle Molitor here with Nectar Consulting and Wonder Woman Unite. I'm so glad you're all here with me today. I have a very special guest, um, an amazing woman. Miss Sheila E. Lewis is coming to you live from Richmond, California. But for all of you who are new to Wonder Woman Unite, um, you know, I'm glad you're here because I created this group as a way to create a space for amazing women, entrepreneurs, business owners, moms, executives, everyday beautiful, amazing women to come together and learn from each other to get new ideas and insights and some helpful hints and tools, hopefully too, to help you be your very best self and the amazing Wonder Woman that you are in your life in so many different ways, shapes, and forms. So um, these interviews come to you uh, every third Friday of the month at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. That's 12.30 Eastern and 5.30 British Standard Time for you folks over there in Europe and the rest of you lovely ladies around the world. I'm sorry, do your own math for the time came because <laughs> my brain doesn't go that far. Um, and so uh, you can always, <coughs> excuse me, you can always go see past interviews at nectarconsulting.com forward slash Wonder Woman Unite or join us on the private Wonder Woman Unite exclamation point um, Facebook page. There's about 180 something members there because there's some other people who created a Wonder Woman Unite exclamation point group. How dare they? <laughs> but anyway, it's all good. There's plenty for everyone, right? So Today, I have the joy of talking with my dear friend and colleague, uh, Sheila Lewis. And Sheila is an amazing strategist and innovator. Um, she works in all sorts of different organizations as a consultant, as a coach, as a cultural advisor. Um, and she has this amazing strategic brain like I've seen in very few people. And I've worked with a lot of amazing consultants and she is by far the top of her class. So um, you can learn more about Sheila at her brand new website that has gone live at Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A-E -E, Lewis, L-E-W-I-S dot com and learn more about the amazing work that she does in the world. So welcome Sheila. I'm so happy you're here with me today. Good morning, Michelle. Thank you so much. And I think I'll just take your introduction and use it everywhere I go. So <laughs> It's a pleasure to be with you, and um, I want to give a shout back at Michelle because Michelle and I have been working together for the last couple of years, and um, I, I don't know that I can say that there have been a lot of uh, seamless partnerships that just kind of work, where it's the yin to the yang. There's the same uh, energy and the spirit of commitment to do good work and uh, present just extremely well um, our product and service to our clients. So um, it was the universe that brought us together and it has been a joy ride working with, with Michelle. You've got a good one here. Uh, well, thank you, my dear. Much, much gratitude. Um, so today we're going to talk about executive presence and what that means, what that really looks like, um, especially, you know, for those, uh, those of you who are in corporate America, but it's beyond those who are in corporate America. It's how you hold yourself, how the room lights up when you walk in and the energy that you emit. I like to call it your energy signature, right? So Sheila's going to tell us more about her perspectives on that. What's that X factor that you have when you walk into the room um, and has people stand up, take notice? What's that gravitas that you have right and identifying maybe some of your blind spots as well to have you be seen from that place right what's in your way of actually standing fully in your power um which then leads into you know how do you step more fully into your leadership skills right um, they all play together so um, we're going to have a, a great conversation. So sit back, grab your, your cup of tea and um, join us. So Sheila, tell us um, a little bit about your background and how you got here and why this topic is so important to you. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, leadership has been uh, kind of in my DNA, I think, since I was born. Uh, I, there's a picture of me in kindergarten where I seem to be holding court um, with my other classmates. And that has, that has been um, my life. It's not, I'm not the person who, uh, who steps forward all the time, but I am the person who seems to be identified. And I think that that speaks to um, this idea of presence. And uh, so my career, actually, I desired to be in retail. That was my, my life when I went to college. I was a business major and a dance minor. And I uh, ended up going to Saks Fifth Avenue in their management training program, which seemed like heaven to me. And I got into the store environment. And I was six months later counting baby diaper covers, Calvin Klein baby diaper covers. This was when names were going on butts, right? <laughs> I was counting these Calvin Klein baby diaper covers and baby pens and doing inventory. And I thought, this is not what I went to college for. This is, this is not the game. And so I quit my job. I didn't have a job to go to. So that was lesson number one, never quit your job if you don't have a job to go to. It's my yes. job. So I was fortunate. My mother had bought me a new Toyota. I was living in Detroit. That was not a great thing, driving a Toyota in Detroit, the home of the uh, <laughs> domestic automakers of the country. So I scooted out of town in my Toyota and drove around the country for six months, landed back at my university, worked there in admissions for a few years, and then went to graduate school. And it was always, I had the intention always to go to graduate school got an MBA in marketing and finance and went to work at Quaker Oats in product management, which was divine. Um, I didn't know uh, why I was on a new product. I really wanted to be on Gatorade, which Quaker, Quaker Oats owned, um, or some big brand like Life Cereal, but I ended up on a new product. And learned uh, strategy and in what is now innovation and carried that through my career to financial services and Visa and then uh, to retail again with the limited. And when I returned to California, decided to start my company, which was a marketing strategy firm. And uh, I just really wanted to see if I could sell my brain. I wanted to see if I was smart. And that was really, corporate America doesn't tell you these things. Corporate America tends to tell you the things you're not, yep. not things that, uh, who you are. And so I struck out just to see if I was smart. And 15 years later, I was still doing it. Um, six months into it, however, my clients started asking me for resources to build out my teams and build the strategies out. And for those of you who are entrepreneurs, you know, and particularly the early stages, the only word you know is yes. And so I said yes, and I started figuring out how to put these teams together. And um, that's how we won our bids. We had very talented senior level consultants that I could bring together uh, who were very highly skilled, specifically skilled for the work we needed to do. And we won these wonderful engagements and I loved the work. I began to grow weary of all of the work and decided to scale up my business in 2012 and added a couple of other areas, staffing and search and transformation. So um, I find myself now with a career that has really been focused on helping companies grow and uh, figuring out how to pivot for growth, how to build sustainability into organizations from an operations perspective. So I have more of a global lens on business today. And I, I can say that that comes from um, my work uh, in new product development. So that's how I got here. Um, leadership, again, is just uh, kind of the cornerstone of my life, I'd say. Fabulous. What an interesting and winding path you've been on, as we all have, right? Yes. Um, but there's always a few bumps and bruises along the way, but you know, what, it, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is so true. <laughs> so true. So true. So true. So tell us more about this idea, this concept of executive leadership presence and what, what that means to you and how um, we as individuals can start to be more conscious of that as we go through our day and the work that we do. Right. So uh, in these, these days of uh, social media and being bombarded with so much information so quickly, uh, all day long and sometimes all night long, right? Uh, we make snap judgments. We make snap considerations of everything. I like this. I don't like this. I want this. I don't want that. 
I see this, I don't see that. I think this, I don't think that. And what that means is that as we show up as human beings, that people are making pretty quick decisions about who you are um, just on face value. And that has to do in some ways with those old antiquated thoughts of, you know, judgment about is she pretty, is she not, do I like her outfit, do I not, do I like his tie, do I not, um, but it's bigger than that, right? Presence has to do with the space that you take up, right, and how you take that space up, um, and it's not necessarily that you have to be the biggest presence in the room, but you have to be the most important presence in the room or among the most impre uh, important um, uh, elements in the room. And that's what presence is, is how do I move in this space of um, dynamically with other people? And um, what's memorable about me and why is it memorable? Is it, um, you know, in some ways people say to me, you have a, a rich voice and it's a memorable voice. And I don't think about that. I don't think about the fact that my register is a little bit lower, but I do realize that in the world of communication, your ears are toned to certain things. And so as I speak, I do know that I can command a certain presence just based on the fact that I have a richer, deeper voice than, than many other women do. Um, that doesn't mean for those of you who have high pitched voices out there that you should pr practice a baritone voice or an alto <laughs> voice. That's not at all what I'm no. suggesting. There <laughs> are other ways, ladies. <laughs> right? There are other ways to accommodate um, that in your communication, um, and those are the kinds of things we talk about in executive uh, presence. So uh, I was actually out for dinner last night, and um, I was. I was told that, you know, my energy was big, you know, that they, people were feeling my energy. And that's what presence is, that when you walk into a room, um, are you noticed or do you walk in uh, questioning why you're there? Do you have that kind of look about you physically and emotionally, which actually shows up. People don't recognize how much their emotions show up in their body and yeah. how they move through a room. Um, do you, you know, squeeze behind people and Kind of make yourself small or do you pat someone on the back and say excuse me I'd like to get through actually make eye contact and have the opportunity for an introduction that might not have happened if you just kind of squeezed by so it's um, it's that instant uh, judgment unfortunately we do live in a, a time a, a, a world of, of judgment and it's that moment where somebody looks at you and says you know I want to know her um, she said something or she moved in a way that made me feel the confidence of her and I want to come and have a, a little conversation and find out more about her. Yeah, no, I really, I love how you describe that, Sheila, because um, it, being a uh, formerly unconfident person, um, I used to be more, I would keep myself small. Right. I um, wasn't sure of myself. I remember my father always used to tell me, stand up straight, speak out, let your voice be heard. And I'll be like, what are you talking about, Dad? <laughs> right? I just I, I didn't have the concept of it um, yeah. all these years later. I finally do. And and so you can see it really easily in people who who don't believe in themselves, who aren't as confident and their energy shrinks right and so if if that's something that maybe you know some of our listeners are are challenged with it's it's about remembering who you are and that you are amazing you're brilliant and you're talented no matter what your role is in the world and the work that you do in the world but the more you believe in yourself the more that confidence will expand and thus your energy expands right Right. I geek out on the neuroscience of all this stuff, right? <laughs> and, right. and so right. you boil us down, we're all just energy, right? And so yes. the the more positive you are about yourself, the higher your energetic vibration or signature will be, the more expansive it will be. And conversely, um, the more you shrink, the more you maybe don't believe in yourself or or in a lower mood, right? Right, right. Your energy comes down and, and it withdraws. So right. 
it's it's about being mindful of that and what's the the impact that you want to have when you walk into the room, right? Right. You know, Michelle, it's so important, and I'm I'm going to take knowing yourself one level down and say, or, be, or being yourself, knowing yourself is really knowing who who am I in this? You know, how who is this person? Right. The belief comes after you know who you are, then you believe who you are. I, in my order, it could be you could believe something, but if you don't know what it is, it's kind of hard to have belief. So I take it one notch down and and say that this idea first and foremost, and I appreciate you talking about your transformation, right? Because it indicates it's possible. I think that oftentimes people believe that who I am and where I am is going to be, this is who I am. This how it is. <laughs> and it really is a choice. You get to choose if you want to, um, uh, if you want to show up in a different way, if you want to show up as a lighter spirit, what does that mean? If you want to show up more confidently, what does that mean for me to do that? Um, and so knowing yourself and knowing, um, being confident in yourself is really the kind of basis of presence. Uh, from that comes everything else. And when you know yourself, you also have some interesting points at which you can engage in conversation. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you. It, and you know, the planet informs you that it's really about everybody else. And if we really understood that, that while we may have this gravitas or this je ne sais quoi, that it's not for me, it's for me to give back. Yes. So having questions, you know, knowing who you are and being able to engage in a conversation, say for example, um, you're at a, a cocktail party or you're at a networking event and you start talking about your business or your life and you say, you know what, I've just been thinking about my values. What are my own personal values, right? And you could start a conversation by saying, my, my number one value is integrity, which is my number one value. And just begin a different kind of conversation that focuses on other people, but it started with you. That is about your own presence and being able to facilitate a discussion with people who you might not know in an area that is about mindfulness and awareness and your, your own being. And that's a totally memorable thing. When people go home and they go, you know, that Michelle, she not only talked about her fabulous company, but she asked some really wonderful questions of us. And that's the engaging part of executive presence. Yeah. You know, the, the idea that people love to talk about themselves, it holds true, right? When you yes. go to say a networking event and you're asking people about them, well, what, tell me about your number one core value or core driver. People like to stop. Wow. Oh, that's a, that's a curious question or an interesting question. Yes. A lot of people have never even been asked before, right? Never. It, it sets them back on their heels a little bit and then like, oh, and it creates that engagement. But what it does also is it allows them to open up to feel seen and heard, right? And that's what humans, all humans want. They want to be seen, heard, and respected. Exactly. So when you can make someone feel seen and heard, it's that, it is that je ne sais quoi, right? That mm -hmm. intangible, but like, that's Sheila. She's, I just like her. I don't know what it is. I just like her, but it's because that other person made us feel good about ourselves. Right. So right. that's, I think another layer of what we're talking about here, but I, I love that you, you were reading my mind because the whole values piece is so, so valuable, right? It's, I remember um, my very first coach that I worked with and that was one of the questions he asked me, what are your, what are your core values? I was like, uh, that, that's a great question. I don't know. I never even thought about it. Right. And I was 34 at the time. And, and so I've learned that when you're clear on your core values, those drivers right. that have you make the decisions you make in every day, because they're so important to you, you can use them as that guidepost right? Which then right. informs your presence right. and informs your style of leadership as well. Absolutely. And I didn't really understand a lot of that when I started my first company. Um, and I grew up in a time in corporate when values were not a discussion. Um, and so today's environment with corporations, 
there are values. Um, and the question is, are you living your values, right? And that, that translates, and we see how that gets messed up. <laughs> we see how, you know, here's our values in our annual report, we're blasted on our, our website, but uh, you know, we don't really adhere to that, here's, here's how. So when I think about um, presence, um, I really do uh, encourage people to come up with their three to five key values, um, because that informs how you walk in the world, right? Um, if I don't operate, if I'm not operating in integrity, I might push someone out of my way at a networking event, right? <laughs> you know, as opposed to pay them out. And not only identify the word, but define the word for yourself. Because what I may call integrity, as defined in Webster's Dictionary, um, I might have some aspects of that that are extended beyond what Webster says about integrity. Um, when I say collaboration, um, that doesn't mean getting ideas from other people and taking them and doing something with it. It really does mean, you know, getting the best thoughts and building on one another and getting to something that is greater than what we could contribute on our own. Mm -hmm. That idea of how do you functionally live into these values? Uh, they're not meant to simply live on a piece of paper and live in your journal, right? They're meant to be exposed to the world and how you carry yourself. And if someone says to me, you know, or says to another person after meeting me that, gosh, you know, she is, she's a real uh, collaborative energy there. You know, she was asking a lot of questions and I see where this is going. That's purposeful. It's, it's deliberate and it, it feeds my soul, right? So you don't want to choose foundational words just to choose them because Michelle's word is this or Sheila's word is that or John's word is this or Sean's word is this. You pick them because they resonate and it takes some time to really understand which are important and you get to a shorter list because you can define a whole lot of things that you think you are or that you want to be and really it's core values. When we say core values, it's those three to five things that you would hang your hat on no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that's how you show up. And so when you show up with this presence, it's not a bouncing ball presence. It's not the presence that shows up at this event is a different kind of energy that shows up at this event. It's a different kind of thing that shows up at that. It is just who you are. It's a natural, instinctive, divine thing within your soul. And that's, that is the core foundation, I believe, of um, executive presence. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. I, I always tell folks, um, when I have them do this type of exercise, you know, the, your values are the things that are like water and air to you that you cannot live without, right? They're at the heart of who you are. <clears throat> and there might be, you know, your, your word or words might be a combination of things. So, so for example, I have a value that I call ocean. And to me, ocean is being a vast, wide, deep container of love that my clients can step into, swim about in, thrash about in, relax in, knowing that they're safe, right? So it's a, it's a value of my presence that I intend to create through my interactions with the folks that I work with, right? Yes. Um, and so everybody's values are different. I had a, one of my trainers, Cynthia Lloyd Darst, who I love, um, she has a, a value called hot monkey love. Right? <laughs> so you can call them anything you want, right? It doesn't matter. But it's about you understanding what that means for you. And yes. whether you share that with others or not, it's, it's who, you, who you choose to be in the world and the impact, the ripple effect that you want to have from your energy that you're expanding out there. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's confidence, right? So that idea that um, I own this space and, and this, is, this is my gift to the universe, right? And you do so confidently. Um, you don't do it apologetically. You don't do it accidentally. You do it confidently. And I can say that confidence for me was born from my family that I didn't have to wait long before I was infused with this idea that there was a place on the planet for me and that um, show up and be present in it. And so confidence I'm, has never been a, a question for me. And I think when I see a lack of confidence in someone else, and it took me a while to understand that everybody didn't show up that way, right? I just, certainly people get that. 
but that's not necessarily the case. And so how do you, how do you engender that in someone? How do you gift them um, the importance of confidently moving through the universe? And in my family, we have a phrase that, that we say, act like you've been there before, right? There's no reason to walk into a boardroom for the first time and be afraid of it. Um, you need to act like you've been there. And that might mean looking around the room to see what other people are doing, where people are taking their seats. You show up to a place that you've just never been to. Um, we're never too old to learn, um, but don't do so uh, shunning yourself. Do so confidently. Move to the seat. And if someone says that's not your seat, ask them which one is. Because <laughs> they're certainly okay. <laughs> for you, <laughs> right? So this idea of um, knowing yourself, believing in yourself, and walking in your confidence also lends itself to this kind of borderline thing called arrogance, mm -hmm. right? And so we talk a lot about confidence and we think that that shows up and we know it shows up in not only um, our language, our spoken word, our body, our written word, how we communicate with other people. Um, there can also be this sense of arrogance that you're just so confident. You know, look at him, <laughs> you know, or look at her. So confident. And then um, you try to engage with that person and you get a sense of, you know, condes condescending conversation or um, I won't even go to demeaning. I think that's just not even uh, appropriate at all. But just someone who's just so absorbed, um, self-absorbed, that it's an arrogant kind of thing, right? Right. So you have to be very careful, um, and, and really I go back to this engagement with other people that certainly as leaders, it's not about us. It is If you think being a leader is about you, <laughs> you're so wrong. That lead from behind principle. Exactly. This is, you choose your leadership style. I happen to operate in servant leadership mode, and um, I think that whatever leadership style you, you select, um, understand that you're not in it for you. You're really in it for those countless people that are, are following your lead or participating with you in your leadership. But I also, I say that the next layer of executive presence is, is confidence for sure. And, and I want to point out something because what I found, um, well, two things, you know, having been someone who grew up without confidence, although my brother is extremely confident he always has been. And I always thought to myself, well, how can how come he's so confident and I'm not? And we grew up in the same family, right? And so I I in my work as a coach, I was on this quest to like reclaim my confidence because um, I had lost it somewhere along the line, right? Um, and I remember actually one of the the things that I have always admired about you, Sheila, and that's really struck me when I first met you was that that clear innate sense of confidence that you just ooze out of your presence. I'm like, how do you, where does that come from? Right. It's, it was a question that I had for a long time and is one of the drivers in the work that I do, right. To help other people find their confidence. But, um, there's also, as we talk about that sense of arrogance of going too far, I found that there's, there's a light and a dark side to confidence, right? The light is standing in who you know you are innately, right? The reason you're here. Um, but the dark side is false bravado. I found that arrogance is usually nine times out of 10 is covering up for deep seated fears that nobody, you don't want anybody else to see because then there yes. might be a crack in your armor, right? So, Oh, I'm all that. And it, but, and, but there, there are those of us who see it. <laughs> I can see yes. through it. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And so yeah. when you come across people like that, who were being arrogant, A, don't take it personally. And B, no. know that um, they're afraid of something that they don't want you to see, right? And just right. send them love and compassion and like, okay, whatever that is, let that be, right? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you're absolutely right, Michelle, because there are many times confidence or arrogance is looking for a place to not be, right? When it is looking for a place where I can let that go and I can actually be my, my true self, but I have this wall up that protects me from really anybody knowing me or 
you know, I can just be this kind of arrogant person and nobody's going to touch me. No one's going to bother me. But when you get into that, to your point, you actually do find this human being that's probably hiding from something. Um, and how, you, you know, it's your, it's your choice whether you want to go in the lion's den um, on that one. But it's more about ensuring that on the outside, we don't get there. We don't go into the lion's den. It's not, that's not a good place. Yeah, and it, you know, it just comes back around to the more you can take the time to know yourself, to know your core values, to know your gifts, your talents, your expertise in any way, shape, or form that you bring to the world and stand in that quietly, confidently, joyfully, then yeah. that creates that expansive presence that has people wander into the room and go, what's that? I'll have what she's having. What is, what's that? <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And you know, confidence comes from effort. Confidence comes from trying, right? If you've never done something before, you might have a lack of confidence about it. But if you keep trying it and build into it, all of a sudden it becomes, ah, that I am that. So in my lifetime, in my childhood, there wasn't anything um, that we asked of our parents um, to do that our parents said no. I mean, there were some things, but things like I want to run for class president. Okay, let's figure out how to run for class president. Um, can, I want to build the homecoming float at our house. Well, all right, how are we, we going to make that work? Um, and we were a part of thinking through what does that mean? Does it mean that the garage has to be empty? Does it mean that we need to clean out the garage? Well, that's on you if you want to build the float in the garage. And then how do we get the float into the garage? Well, we have to have a truck. And so you start kind of going through everything, figuring it out and trying, and it builds this sense of, I can kind of do anything I, I put my mind to. There's, and that's what confidence is, right? Um, and so I really do go back to my childhood and I'm grateful for parents who said, uh, well, then let's figure out how you can do that. You know, how do we try at that? And it's like my young older brother who taught us how to run track and how to play tennis and how to shoot a basketball. And um, you just keep trying until you get it. And that is the essence of, of the underpinning of how you gain confidence in, in doing the next thing. Yeah. And as you you try here and you try there. Ultimately, you find the things that resonate with your heart and your spirit that like, oh, yeah, this is, this is the thing. This, this is, is my thing. thing. This is my zone that I like, oh, you can show up fully in. And oftentimes, it's that, um, I call it your genius zone, that place where you're almost unconscious to it because it comes so naturally to you, right? Right. Um, right. When you can recognize, oh, that doesn't come naturally to other people. For you, it was confidence, just came naturally to you. Um, and, and so when you can recognize that, oh, then that becomes one of your superpowers, right? And how you learn how to wield it out in the world, um, you know, in a good way. Right. And then the other part, um, I think, is communication, right? So... Um, and, and I kind of leave EQ into, you know, and emotional intelligence into this idea of executive presence, right? We demand far more from our leaders today than we did two decades ago. You know, somebody could sit at the top of an organization and be a jerk and it was okay um, because he sat at the top of the, of the organization and I intentionally said he sat at the top of the organization. Today, the requirements of leadership are very different. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean transparent leadership, but it certainly means being aware of a bigger land out there that I'm, I'm managing and I'm having an impact on. And being able to uh, communicate in a trusting, um, deliberate, truthful way. Um, my mother said, you don't always have to tell everything you know, right? You just have to tell enough that the person you're talking to gets it. So. Um, it doesn't mean, it means that you're speaking in your truth, but everyone needs, might need a different message. You know, different groups of people may need, need a different message. And so it's important to understand that in our leadership, that communication as executive presence is critical. If you're seen as someone who um, does not seek 
participation and does not communicate well, that's not uh, good leadership uh, presence. And what's interesting is that as there's a, you know, a bit of a transition going on in organizations with women rising to the top um, and having more senior level positions, it challenges our male counterparts to understand the different dynamics of communication um, that women have versus men. And it does require us not to simply be bold and go in and say, you've got to figure it out because this is how we do it. It's that I'm going to help you figure it out um, because it's necessary for the success of our company. And that is a different presence, right? You can be bulldog and just go in and say, mm, time's up, guys. It's all about women and you got to figure it out. Or you can go in and say, yes, time's up. It is about women, but it's also about allyship. It is about creating an environment where we coexist, where we get the best out of one another, and that requires language. And I think that we fall short often in, um, in these situations as leaders where we become defensive and resistant because we are simply there to be the woman at the table, and so I'm gonna hold my place. Well, the win is getting to the table. That's the win. And the next win is how do I successfully, seamlessly integrate this new presence into this environment that hasn't been there for me? Well, again, I can't do it small. I don't have to do it bold, but I do have to do it with presence and um, a spirit of engagement, holding my own. And so, you know, you sometimes have to hear yourself say these things out loud. You have to look in the mirror and say to yourself as you're going into these big events that there's a reason why you're there. And it's the same reason why you've been everywhere. And so don't let that environment close you down from speaking. Because one of the reasons that we're there is that we bring a different perspective. Yes. So if your voice isn't heard, um, then that perspective is lost. And, and the result on the other side is, well, she was here, but she didn't say anything. You know, I didn't hear anything different from the things that we've always said. And it's not also, I'll take that a step further, it's not necessarily that we say something different, it may be the way we say it, right? So those of you who've worked in places where you've hired consultants and realize that you just need an external voice to say what you've been saying so you can get it done because nobody believes you, it's that kind of thing, right? That we just need to uh, use our words and make them powerful not, um, not uh, I, I say challenging, but not in a mean-spirited way, right? That I want to make my point. Uh, I don't know if you all listened or recently saw this video from the University of Notre Dame women's basketball coach. Who was downright angry. I don't know if there was a question that was asked of her, um, but she was just angry about the fact that in women's basketball, and we just finished March Madness, right? Um, that there are not more women coaches. And she's like, you know, this doesn't make any sense. There's not enough women in power. And she's quoted something, and I'm not gonna, I don't know that this is right, but I'm gonna throw it out, out there. Something like 75 or 80% of women's basketball teams in college are coached by men. But no woman coaches a man's basketball team. And so it's, it's very forceful, very deliberately, not angry, but really it's passionate about what she was communicating. And that's where we have to get, and that as, as leaders that we're passionate about something, we're not beating anybody up, but we're stating the facts. And we are stating it in a way that people can hear it. That is another element of executive presence. Oh, that's, and that's a great point. You know, helping people feel it, right? But not beat them over the head with it, right? Um, because oftentimes women, when they're standing in their power, it gets translated somehow as being bitchy, bossy, or an angry, angry woman, right? Which is not the case. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're talking about is, is filling the room with that grace and generosity and compassion, but passion for the expertise that you own in being the expert that you are. So, right, right. So thank you, my dear. Gosh, it's, this has been such a juicy, delicious conversation. We could probably talk all day about this. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And good luck out there, ladies. Go do the thing.
Yeah, so just to remind you, you know, please uh, feel free to visit Sheila at SheilaELewis.com. Um, check out her work or get in contact with her if you have other questions. And uh, yes. always feel free to visit the NectarConsulting.com website forward slash Wonder Women Unite to check out the other previous interviews that we've had um, over the last almost three years now. So thank you again, Ms. Sheila, for being here. And um, our next conversation will be next May on the 17th. So thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Thanks, Michelle. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.